Uh, thanks, and uh, I'm very honored uh, to be speaking at this momentous occasion. Um, and uh, I'm obviously very pleased that it was put on, and I rec want to recognize that it, this was the result of a lot of work by Jeff and Anita and many others, and I, I really appreciate that. I was a little worried that I would have to uh, give this talk so that it would be intelligible to some of the 19 grandchildren. <laughs> and I don't see any of them here, so I, I feel a little better. Okay. Uh, I, what I hope to do is actually talk a little bit about Fred uh, personally, or my interactions with Fred, focusing much more on the science than, than what you've heard so far. And I know uh, Fred has many important interactions with the uh, administration of the City University and so forth, but I, I think I see a different side of Fred. And some of my best interactions uh, with the provost of, of this college are actually, actually take place over Skype uh, with the video uh, while Fred's in his pajamas, which is probably a different side of them than many of, many of you see, okay. But uh, my interactions with Fred uh, have taken uh, interesting turns and I, I hope to convince you in the next few minutes that some of those are actually uh, interactions and, and, and we've had uh, joint interests that I didn't anticipate uh, when I first got to know him and, and even over the recent years. So uh, I'm gonna, try to tell you a little bit about science and the scientific interactions we've had. And so for starters, uh, these are yeast cells that have been fluorescently labeled with the alpha factor that you just heard about. Uh, and they're viewed under a fluorescent microscope. And a lot of our work has actually grown out of an interaction with Fred's lab where we use fluorescent peptides for many different purposes. Okay. Uh, Fortunately, Jeff already introduced uh, some information about G-protein coupled receptors. I had sort of a personal uh, spiritual revelation in the mid-90s, about 20 years ago, uh, where I realized that uh, my lab had experience in yeast genetics, and I had a long-standing interest in uh, membrane proteins, and uh, that maybe I could bring these two interests together and uh, apply my abilities and knowledge of yeast to studying G-protein coupled receptors in yeast. And uh, if you were listening carefully to Jeff's talk, you'll realize that I came to this startling re revelation 15 years after Jeff and Fred came to this revelation. And that's sort of a recurring theme that I've, I've discovered a lot of things that I thought were incredibly important. And it was often a decade or so after Fred and Jeff discovered them. and uh, I'm still running to catch up. Uh, but G-protein coupled receptors, as you heard, are very important in many different signaling processes. There are 800 in the human genome, as you heard. Uh, now, you can start fights at meetings over this question of how many drugs target G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, Jeff said they're 40% of all drugs. This is a paper that claims that uh, something like 25% of all drugs target G-protein coupled receptors. Um, and so in, in my lab, we've decided to settle this, and we just sort of have agreed to say that 110% of all drugs target G-protein coupled receptors. <laughs> uh, but a, a, as you just heard, uh, G-protein coupled receptors are found in yeast, and they're inv involved in the uh, mating response that allows two haploid cells uh, to come together and detect the presence of the opposite cell type and form a diploid. And uh, as Jeff mentioned, it, it is a useful model for understanding G-protein coupled signaling in mammalian systems and other systems. And one piece of evidence for this is the fact that, uh, as Ken Jac Jacobson and others have uh, shown, you can express mammalian receptors in yeast at a ligand or hormone that would normally bind to the mammalian receptors and the yeast think they're getting ready to mate. It's kind of a cruel trick. But it's been used uh, very effectively for many different purposes, including uh, drug screening at, at a number of companies. 
So it's an important system for understanding an important signaling process. Uh, and the reason for studying it in yeast is that there, uh, it's been this process in yeast has been studied for uh, many decades now, and there are very nice readouts for telling whether signaling is working. You can select for cells that signal, you can select against cells that signal. And in my lab, we're sort of impatient with the mutagenic approaches that many people take to study proteins, where you change a residue to one other residue and you see what happens, and then you change one other residue to one other. And, and we like to make thousands or millions of changes in a protein at one time, and then use what we call the awesome power of yeast genetics to find that rare mutant that does something really interesting. And this is a capability that you have in yeast that you really don't have uh, in a lot of other systems, in most other systems. Okay, so uh, in the mid-90s, I, I went to a Gordon conference. By the way, it's amazing the pictures that you can find on the web. Okay. And uh, I looked up, I googled Fred for images, and I, there are just dozens of pictures up there. And, and I thought, well, boy, Google's really amazing, and, and uh, they're, you know, probably you can find this for everybody. So then I Googled myself for images. I found one picture from my department webpage, and I found dozens and dozens of pictures of baby cheetahs and leopards, and it turned out there's a wildlife photographer named Mark Dumont. Okay, so <laughs> I learned something. But uh, this picture of Fred and Leah is sort of the Fred that I know and I want to talk about. So, uh, and it's really, as you know, focusing on Fred, the scientist. So I went to a Gordon conference in the mid-90s. I met Fred. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking. I didn't go fishing with him, which I think he still probably holds against me. Um, and I regret it. But, uh, you know, you meet many people at meetings. Uh, but we talked about uh, collaborating. And uh, in many cases, nothing comes of it. But in Fred's case, something did come of it. And, and I actually had no idea what would come of it uh, at the time. And, uh, but it began with Fred sending some peptides, as he said he would, and uh, they were alpha factor and alpha factor analogs, and they were a tremendous help to us. And over the years, Fred has sent us many, many peptides, and uh, he's done it very graciously and willingly, and Boris has done a lot of hard work to make some of these peptides. Uh, but he didn't always want to send them. Sometimes I would call him and ask him for peptides, and he's a busy guy, and, you know, if they're not interesting peptides, uh, well, we, we developed a strategy. So uh, often we, I would call him up and I, I would say, well, Fred, uh, you know, this peptide, if, you, if somebody could make it, it would be really interesting, but I think it's probably too hard to make. And, and, <laughs> and, and then, you know, a week later, we'd get it in the mail. It was great. So, uh, but the, you know, I, I definitely do not want to leave you with the idea that, that we benefit only from getting peptides because Fred, as you've heard, it takes science very seriously and he follows through. So we had many dis have had many discussions about science and, uh, and that has led to many changes in, in research in my lab. And, but another very important interaction has come over the writing of manuscripts. And it's often uh, with some trepidation that I inform Fred that a manuscript is ready for him to look at because he really reads these papers. And I don't always want to see what he has to say about them, but it's always valuable. And he really takes his responsibilities very seriously in terms of making sure that he understands and at least modestly agrees with everything that's in that paper. And I think this even gets back to uh, what President Fritz was saying earlier, that it, uh, a real scientist can state facts in plain language. And, and I have a problem in that I often, at least in the first draft, uh, what I write has very little resemblance to plain language. And I'm very grateful for Fred pointing that out in many circumstances. Okay, so uh, as, as a result, this is a list of 11 papers that uh, I published together with Fred. Most of these are actually papers from my lab, but we also benefited greatly from having uh, 
visitors from the Nader lab, including Enrique Arafala, who's here uh, today, um, and also Dr. Tantry, who came a few years ago and spent some time in my lab. And so that's been great. Um, and, uh, but I, I actually want to digress for a minute or two and tell you about an unexpected uh, aspect in which my lab is following the work of, of Fred's lab. So uh, I, my lab has been part of a structural genomics project where our goal is to solve X-ray uh, crystal structures of membrane proteins and to develop improved techniques for solving these structures. And uh, this is a joint project together with Michael Malkowski at the Hauptman Woodward Institute in Buffalo, New York, and Michael Wiener at the University of Virginia. And I'm not going to go into any details on this except to tell you that we solved the structure a couple of years ago of a CAX protease, which is a, a transmembrane protein, which is involved in the processing of farnesylated proteins. And uh, it's, it's actually, in my mind, a very interesting structure. It has seven transmembrane helices, like the receptors do, uh, although it's not a receptor. It has a huge internal cavity, which is big enough to hold uh, 400 water molecules or a 10,000 molecular weight protein. And we really, it has an active site with a zinc that looks like thermolysin, another well-studied enzyme. And we have no idea how the substrates get into this cavity where they have to reside in order to be cleave. Um, and the job of this uh, enzyme is to uh, cleave uh, proteins that are farnesylated. And Jeff already mentioned that uh, the two of them had studied farnesylated proteins. I, I sort of knew they had done this, but I uh, hadn't really thought about it carefully uh, when we were working on this protein. Uh, and the uh, cleavages occur, uh, one of the remarkable things about this enzyme is that cleavages occur in the same peptide at two sites, a, a site where the farnesylation occurs and then at an upstream site as well. And two substrate, only two substrates are known for this enzyme. One is the yeast a factor that you heard about a few minutes ago, which is a farnesylated protein. It gets a farnesyl group attached at a cysteine residue here, and then it gets cleaved at an upstream site, uh, and then there's an additional cleavage, but that leads to the release of the mating factor. In humans, there's a very similar enzyme called zinc metalloprotease, sterol 24, named after the yeast protein, because the yeast protein was discovered first. And it also catalyzes two cleavages. And if you express the human protein in yeast, it can cut the uh, mating factor. Uh, and the substrate, only substrate that's known in humans is a nuclear scaffold protein called nuclear prelamin A. And uh, we thought this was a fascinating protein uh, from the biological standpoint. Farnesylation is important in a lot of uh, important physiological processes. But while we were studying it, it was discovered that people have defects in this processing pathway, either because the substrate has a defect or because the enzyme has a defect, uh, these people get progeria, premature aging. And it's, uh, in the extreme cases, it's a horrible disease where a 15-year-old can look like they're 60. It's very rare, but it's a fascinating situation. And there's also an idea that incomplete processing by this enzyme may be part of the normal aging process because partially processed products accumulate in those of us who are aging, which is all of us, but some more than others. Okay. Uh, and it's also an interesting situation because it turns out uh, other people have showed and we've confirmed that this enzyme is inhibited by uh, HIV protease inhibitors. So uh, many people who are living with HIV take uh, antiretroviral therapy and, and do so for decades. And it's been, you know, it's changed their lives. It's allowed people to survive uh, nearly normal lives. But there are side effects, which I'm not going to go into, but some of them in include redistributions of fat under the skin called lipodystrophy. And some of these side effects may be due to uh, inhibition of sterile 24 enzymes, because if you lose sterile 24, people who have defective sterile 24 also have uh, lipodystrophy. So it's interesting uh, as a possible unintended target of HIV drugs. But, uh, you know, it wasn't until I really had been working on this for a while that I remembered that 
Fred and Jeff had really done the first synthesis uh, of the uh, farnesylated peptide, the DA factor. So again, I was, in this case, uh, this is from 1989, so I'm uh, you know, 20 years behind them or more. I'm still running to catch up. And they published 17 additional papers on this path. My lab has also recently started working on HIV, and I'm not going to go into any details on this, but we've been wondering whether some of the techniques that we developed using fluorescent peptides and flow cytometry with yeast could be adapted to developing uh, altered forms of the envelope protein from the HIV virus that might be, have better properties as a vaccine than some of the things that have been tried recently, and, and probably most of you know that HIV vaccine development has been spectacularly unsuccessful. So we have developed a process where uh, we are expressing, uh, uh, well, just to, um, well, we've developed a process where we're expressing the HIV envelope protein at the surface of yeast cells and using the techniques that are available in yeast for large-scale mutagenesis and screening to see if we can get a variant of the envelope protein that has better binding properties for antibodies than the wild-type protein. And I'm going to skip over this. Uh, and to make a long story short, we've been able to express the envelope protein at the surface of yeast in various configurations. We're fusing the protein, either fusing the protein to a cell wall protein called SAG1, uh, or we're fusing it to another uh, protein called AGA2 that binds to a cell wall protein called AGA1. And this has proved to be a very difficult problem technically, uh, but we've been able to express the protein. And so these are flow cytometry traces. Uh, flow cytometer is an instrument where cells go through one at a time, and you can measure the fluorescent properties of each cell as it goes through. And then you make a histogram where the vertical axis is the number of cells, the horizontal axis is the amount of fluorescence. And if you have yeast that don't express anything, they have a certain amount of fluorescence. But what this shows in the green trace is that if you have yeast that, fluoresce, that express an envelope glycoprotein, and you add an, actually a human-derived antibody that can neutralize the HIV virus, that antibody can bind to the envelope glycoprotein at the surface of yeast cells, and it can uh, cause an increase in fluorescence because we're using a fluorescent uh, secondary antibody to de detect the binding of the first antibody. So this shows that uh, we can express the envelope glycoprotein on the surface of yeast. And uh, what we hope to do is, without going into details, is develop variants that bind not only to the mature form of this neutralizing antibody, but to the precursor form that's in an earlier stage from antibody development and, and we believe that if we can make a variant that binds better to this precursor form of the antibody, it will stimulate the immune response better. And this shows we have developed a, a synthetic antibody that looks like the precursor form. And this slide, without going into detail, shows that the envelope glycoprotein that we've expressed does not bind the precursor antibody, but does bind the mature antibody, which is what we wanted, because then we can develop, use the system to develop a variant that does bind the precursor antibody better. And there's one antibody that's worked particularly well for these studies, and that's an antibody that we love it, uh, and uh, respect, and it's called 44752D, not a very picturesque name. But again, uh, looking through the literature, uh, Fred, uh, working with uh, Jacob Anglister, has published two papers on this antibody binding to uh, uh, peptides. And in this case, we're not quite as far behind. These are from 2009, and uh, we haven't published anything on this yet, so we're only at least six years behind. Okay. So, you know, there's just multiple ways in which Fred and Jeff or, or Fred have been ahead of us. And they published 11 additional papers in the HIV field. Okay. Uh, in the last few minutes, I want to tell you a, a couple recent results that, that are results we really don't understand, uh, but that relate very intensely to the work that I've done together with Fred and Jeff on understanding the signaling by the sterile 2 receptor, which is the alpha factor receptor. We know, how am I doing on time? We got a couple more minutes? 
Okay. Um, we know a lot about the structure now of the receptor and the G protein. Um, and, you know, G protein signaling has made it into the textbooks. This is from Vote and Vote, a common biochemistry textbook. And students who look at these pictures think that we actually understand all this stuff. And, and, you know, it's really a nice diagram, and it shows that the receptor interacts with the G protein, it releases GDP binds. But if you look in detail, I think Fred will agree with me, we really don't understand any of these individual steps. Uh, and so we, one, one advantage of the yeast system that I didn't mention is that people consider it a simple system. There's only one or, or two receptors in any given cell type. There's only one type of G protein as opposed to mammalian cells where there can be hundreds of receptors and different combinations of G protein subunits can run into the hundreds. And so we think that yeast should be a simple system and we ought to be able to understand this simple system before we can understand mammalian systems. Uh, and so uh, one thing we talk about uh, in, in signaling systems is different types of ligands. And we, there's a model where the receptor goes from an active state to an inactive state in its equilibrium. And certain types of ligands like agonists bind to the active state and stabilize it. And they signal a, a trigger a signaling response. Uh, inverse agonists bind to the inactive state and inhibit signaling responses. And antagonists bind to both. And they don't shift the equilibrium and they don't cause signaling, but they can inhibit signaling if they're mixed with an agonist. So this is sort of a model that pharmacologists really like. And we sort of uh, wanted to follow and see how well this applied in yeast. And so th this is from a paper by, from Mel Simon's lab from 2003. And it shows that the signaling output measured in several different ways from the pheromone receptor is remarkably proportional to the binding of, of an agonist, the alpha factor, to the receptor. And so one of these is the binding curve, and the other three are signaling uh, measures measured at three different stages of the signaling pathway. One is G protein activation, one is transcription, and one is cell cycle arrest. And these are all downstream effects of signaling. And they all line up, if you normalize them correctly, they line up exactly on top of each other. And it looks like signaling is just a factor, a measure, uh, or the amount of signaling you get is just determined by how many receptors are occupied by ligand. It's a very simple system, and it seems like everything is understood. But uh, problems arise. And so one thing we can do in yeast, and that you can do in many systems, is vary the number of receptors in a cell. And I'm not going to go into all this, but we can uh, vary over approximately 50-fold the number of receptors we express in a cell. And you can make predictions how that should affect the signaling strength. And I will just tell you that if you have many more receptors, like 10 times the number of receptors, you should have a stronger response at lower agonist concentrations. And this is sort of standard pharmacology just from the binding equations and so forth. If you have more receptors, you don't need as high a concentration to activate the signaling response if the response is a function of the number of receptors. And so, you know, we expected we would find this in yeast, although people had looked at this before and, it, and the results were a little unclear, but we've repeated a lot of these experiments very, very carefully. This is a student in the lab, Rajasri Sridharan, who graduated recently. And so here's the dose response curve that we measured for cells that just express a chromosomal copy of the sterile 2 receptor. Should be chromosomally encoded sterile 2 here. And uh, that's the response we see. And uh, what happens if we express the receptor from a multi-copy plasmid where there's at least 10 times as many receptors? I just showed you that this should have made the response more sensitive than the single copy, but in fact, we see the opposite. It's less sensitive. Uh, and so Rajasri repeated these results under many different circumstances. Uh, and um, I'm going to skip this. Uh, and I would just tell you, uh, we've done this over and over, and having more receptors in yeast does not lead to a larger signaling response. And what we actually see is that over a wide range of receptor expression levels, signaling is proportional to the fraction of receptors that are occupied, not the number of receptors that are occupied. And this is a much harder result to explain. 
and we're working quite hard on this. Now, another collaboration between our lab and Fred and Jeff has been the use of antagonists. And so these are antagonist peptides that were discovered by Fred and Jeff. And they are alpha factor peptides that are modified at the amino termini. Uh, and we just call them DTA, DTIR3, and DTH. And uh, these were advertised by uh, Fred's group to bind to receptors but not cause activation. And Rajasri repeated this under very rigorous circumstances. And this just shows that these uh, cells expressing either chromosomal sterile 2 or sterile 2 from a centromere plasmid or a multicopy plasmid all respond very well to agonists, but they do not respond to these antagonists, which is what is supposed to happen. Okay. And furthermore, the antagonists compete very nicely with the normal agonists. If you add increasing amounts of these uh, antagonists and you have a fluorescent agonist, you can see that this is a binding experiment using fluorescence, and you can see that you're competing off the agonists. Everything's as it should be and as it was published. And so what we ran into trouble with was measuring the signaling output. So if you have an agonist alone, you get a certain signaling response. And if you have an and if you have, uh, let's see, antagonist alone, no response. Okay, that's what you expect. And then when you add a mixture, or when you have a mixture of antagonist and agonist, the antagonist should compete, and it should require a much higher concentration of agonist to cause a, the same signaling response. And I'm not going to go through details, but there's a whole mathematical analysis called shield analysis where people calculate the dose of agonist that's required to give a certain signaling response in the presence and absence of the antagonist. And we've been through all this and done dozens and dozens of measurements. And I'm going to skip all the math. Um, but the, the bottom line is, this is what we did. The filled circles are what we see with agonists alone. Then when we have antagonists present, we see a shift. And that's as it should be, as, and as I just showed you. But if we actually calculate the magnitude of the shift, we, it requires 22, in presence of five micromolar antagonists, uh, it requires 22 times as much agonist to give the same response. That all seems fine. But if you, if you know the binding constant for agonists and you know the binding constant for antagonists, you can calculate what this ratio should be. And when you do that, the ratio turns it, that you expect turns out to be 900, not 22. And biology is not an exact science, okay. Uh, uh, this is a sore point, you know, between physicists, and we calculate things to 10 significant figures and biologists. But even for a biologist, a factor of 40 or 50 is a bit of a discrepancy. And, and so we really think something is wrong here. And, and we're trying to figure out what it is. So this is, uh, this is actually the curve that you would expect. And this is a log scale. So this is a huge discrepancy. And uh, Roger Shree has repeated this over different levels of receptor expression and many different yeast strains that I don't have time to tell you about. And so this is something that's it, it's really uh, telling us something that I think is very interesting, and, and we're trying to figure it out. Uh, one other thing that unexpected uh, finding that we found uh, in analyzing the results uh, with antagonists had to do with the internalization of ligand. I don't know if you can see this very well. Can the lights come down at all? Um, but these are fluorescent uh, microscope images of a fluorescent, uh, in the, this case, it's actually a fluorescent alpha factor made by Boris, uh, where it's bound to cells. And after two minutes with the cells, you can see it on the outside of the cell. I can't see very well from this angle. But after 20 minutes, the uh, agonist is internalized. And it ends up in internal compartments, and it forms these punctate structures. And that's all that's been published many times, and that's what you expect for agonist. Antagonist, remember, does not cause a signaling response. So we've recently asked the question, what happens with antagonist on cells? And uh, we were shocked to discover, or surprised to discover, it's basically the same. Uh, the antagonist binds initially on the outside of the cells, and then after 20 minutes, it's internalized. So an antagonist, at least for this receptor, and I think I can make the case for many receptors, is not something that just inhibits signaling by agonists. 
it can drive the receptor into a state where in this case, it's recognized by the endocytotic machinery and taken into the cell, even though it has not driven the receptor into a state where it can actually cause a G protein mediated signaling response. Okay, so, uh, and I, I could actually go on for quite a while and I won't, okay. But there are many other things, some of them discovered by Fred and Jeff that we re actually don't understand about how the details of how the signaling system works. And I think even in this very, very simple G protein mediated signaling system, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I know Fred's gonna to start to do it in the next few weeks. Okay. <laughs> I, I've been meaning to tell you actually, you will be getting a manuscript in the next week or two. So I hope you're clearing your, your schedule. Okay. Uh, so I, I've, what I've told you so far uh, really is that uh, as receptor number varies, signaling does not vary as you would, in the way that you would expect if signaling was dependent on the number of occupied receptors. An antagonists, which can actually be viewed as a way of modulating the number of available receptors on a cell for, for, that are available for binding agonists, uh, signaling in the presence of antagonists does not behave in the way we would expect if signaling was dependent on receptor numbers. And also, uh, antagonist-occupied receptors are internalized, and this has been seen also in some other in mammalian systems. And one explanation that we've been working to some extent on is uh, involves interactions between receptors, and I, I'm not gonna go into details on this. It's a sore point with Fred that I've been pop promising to publish some of these results for more years than I want to say, and, and it, I just want to say, you know, it's, you know, we're working on it, okay? Um, and uh, I, I, we have some ideas for how uh, some of these unusual signaling properties might arise, and one of the ideas that we're particularly interested in is that receptors don't just have a positive signaling function, but unoccupied receptors may actually function to keep the signaling pathway turned off. And I think uh, there's several pieces of evidence, aside from our work in the yeast system, that suggest that this might be the case, and it's something we're very interested in pursuing. Um, so I'll just tell you, uh, this work, the work I told you about uh, on the receptors today was done primarily by Rajashri Sridharan, who uh, recently graduated and now is doing a postdoc in Buffalo, and by Sarah Connolly, who's here today, uh, a long-standing uh, technician in my lab who's also responsible for a lot of the HIV work that we're doing, and uh, various other people in the lab have uh, cl collaborated on many aspects of this uh, in our work with Fred and Jeff. And again, I just want to say, again, uh, it's amazing the pictures you find on the web, um, but thank you, Fred, and also thanks to Anita for making a lot of this possible. You want to open the floor to some questions or comments? Yes, please. Use that, Use that microphone there, please. So is it possible uh, that the overexpression of receptors on the, sur on the membrane surface or in the membrane I will not actually have all receptors viable due to folding. And also, maybe the overexpression will not actually have every G protein attached to them, too. Absolutely. So, uh, so, in response to the first question, do all the receptors we express fold? And uh, I didn't show you the data, but our belief that they are expressed at high levels is based on binding experiments. So they absolutely, the numbers that I sort of cited are based on numbers of ligand binding sites. So when we overexpress the receptors, they at least fold well enough to bind the ligand with high affinity. In terms of whether some of them are preferentially associated with G proteins, and so only certain receptors may be uh, capable of signaling, it's something we've thought a lot about, and we've addressed it by trying to overexpress G proteins. So we put all three G protein subunits on a plasmid 
we overexpress all three subunits. And if it was due to a limitation in G proteins, we should see a difference in this behavior, and we don't. Uh, we've also tried the interactions with, stable interactions with G proteins are thought to involve the C-terminal tail of the receptor. And we see the same effects when we cut off the C-terminal tail of the receptor. So to first approximation, we don't think it's due to interactions with G proteins. And we think the receptors are, in fact, folded because they bind ligand with high affinity. But they're very good questions that we've thought a lot about. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, do antagonists affect trafficking of D2 uh, for the alter the amount that gets to the membrane? Well, we're looking at short term. So they're, they're grown, and then the, and so we're only looking really, it's, and then the cells are, have been kept in the cold. So until we actually do this experiment. So we don't think, we think the times we're looking at, two minutes and 20 minutes, are too short to affect the trafficking of new receptors to the membrane. If that, does that answer your question? Okay, 20 minutes seems like on the edge though. Well, we, in, in, in the case of sterile two, we know approximately how long it takes for them to start making new ones. And, and it's, it's longer than this. That's a good point. So, so one thing that's very nice about today is to see data that I haven't seen. <laughs> one thing that's very nice today is to see data that I haven't seen. The, the question that I have about the lack of uh, quantitative agreement of the antagonist result. Now, in the GPCR field, there are many people who've done pharmacology on GPCR with antagonists. Is this a general phenomenon? You know, you're right. You're absolutely right. There are many people who have done this. Um, I don't think that many people have done it that carefully, though. I mean, y you yourself, if, not, not to pick on one person, but have published a shift in the response. Um, but in order to actually d observe this discrepancy, you absolutely have to know the affinity of your agonist, your antagonist, and there have not been that many studies where people look carefully at this. But I would welcome, you know, it's a huge literature, as you say, to look through, and I, maybe before I send you the manuscript, I will look through it a little more carefully. <laughs> so, Mark, uh, you hinted, you didn't really talk much about this, but you hinted, I guess, from your slides that you're really thinking this has to do with dimers or multimers. Is that correct? That's where you're thinking what the, the base of the phenomenon? Uh, I'm open on this. So you can think up simple models of oligomerization that could affect uh, the dose response. For example, if receptors are a tetramer and it only requires one molecule in the tetramer to be occupied, that would give you a different dose response curve, and it actually would be in the right direction. Uh, it would be a different dose response curve compared to a situation where all four would have to be occupied. But I've run simulations on this, and if you run the numbers, it is the right direction, but it's no, it, a simple model like what I just said does not get you anywhere near being able to explain the results. What could get you to, uh, explain the results is if there was a cooperative interaction between receptors. So that, and I had a slide that I skipped over from Jonathan Javich where he has, at Columbia, where he has beautiful work, where if you have an antagonist, he has receptor dimers of dopamine receptors. If you have an antagonist, or actually not an antagonist, but an inverse agonist bound to one of the members of the dimer, and an agonist bound to the second one, you get a bigger response than if you have two agonists. And so it's a very complicated, so if you're starting to invoke those kind of things, you could get much bigger effects. We have no evidence for that, and it's sort of a blue sky type of question, but it's an important and interesting thing to think about. And we actually got into this because we were interested in oligomers, and we were trying to get that manuscript done. And I thought, well, depending on the size of the oligomer, if any of these models are correct, the dose response should be different. If, if you have tetramer and, you, and uh, so we started doing these careful titrations. 
And, and that's when we got distracted because none of it seemed to make sense. Michael. Mark, a question. Uh, you say that you evaluate or you estimate the number of receptors by binding assays. Uh, did you try to assess number of receptors by independent uh, method that is not based on binding? There might be receptors that don't bind, but they are there and they do something else. And another comment, uh, in your uh, studies, do you take into account changes in on-off rate as a function of number receptors in the membrane? And a third comment, there is another family of G protein coupled receptors. Um, so we, we also have, in response to the first question about binding, we have done all our uh, estimations of receptor number. We, we've run Western blots to look at the total numbers of receptors, um, and they are roughly in line with what we see with the binding. One thing I have to say is that if you make GFP tagged receptors, uh, in, depending on your background, most of the receptors are not actually at the cell surface. So we really want to look, we feel binding is about as good as we can do because we don't want to look at all those receptors that are actually inside the cell. Um, the second question was, uh, remind me. Oh yeah, so yeah, the kinet kinetics of this could be very important. And we've done some simple experiments. All the exper competition experiments with agonists are done by mixing the two compounds, the agonist and antagonist, together and, and looking at a simultaneous uh, interaction uh, with the cells. Um, but we have considered the possibility that there could be different off rates for agonist and antagonist, even though they have the same KD. Um, and we've done some experiments where we add one and try and see it coming off. But it's, the off rates are very, although Fred and Jeff did it many years ago, for us, met with, at least with the fluorescent compounds, we've had a lot of technical problems in measuring the off rates. And the off rates are actually quite slow. And some of the times that you have to wait to measure the off rates are so slow that we don't trust the cells after that amount of time. So it's an important and interesting question that I don't know the answer to. Um, you skipped over some math earlier. Could you put that back up, please? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to explain it. I just want to look at it. A little bit further. Thank you. Yeah, just leave that there. Okay. Thanks. Oh, okay. This is pretty much shield analysis. If you look at uh, uh, Lee Lindbergh's book, or you know. Okay. Um, the, and the, of course, the, it's uh, fascinating to attend a symposium like this. Um, the E-System has offered many um, tools to understand, to a certain extent, the ver invincible G-protein coupling business. In the mammalian system, as you said, it's become more complicated because there are GPCRs which are called GPRs, which don't end up in the membrane, which remain next to the membrane. And they somehow control signal. They bind to ligand. Something occurs between these receptors and the traditional GPCRs at the membrane. Does yeast have such GPRs? Um, has anyone noted that? And has any interaction between these receptors, these GPRs and the GPCRs, been noted? Well, this, uh, of course, when something is discovered in mammalian cells, the first thing we do is do a blast search to see if it's found in an interesting organism. Um, but, 
So I'm actually, I, I'd be happy to talk about this, but I'm not that familiar with the GPR. I mean, what I think of is there are many GPCRs that have given, been given GPR designations, and including the adhesion receptors and so forth. And uh, so I, I'd have to talk to you about what you're actually referring, but the GPR proteins that have been given GPR designations, including a lot of viral proteins and, and, it, and these adhesion receptors, which look like they're very, very important, as far as I know, still have seven transmembrane regions, but have extended uh, aqueous regions that, that have different properties. But it's something that I don't know, I, I need to talk to you more about what, what you're referring to. Okay. Well, okay, the estrogen receptors, again, it's a story I don't know very well, except that people argue about it a lot. Okay. Okay, I want to thank Mark again, and uh, 